Welcome back to another episode of the Strength and Speed Podcast. I'm your host, Mudgear Hannibal Race Pro, Evan Preparis. I've got a guest with me on the line. Before we get to him, though, a quick word from this episode's sponsor. This episode is brought to you by OCR Buddy. If you haven't downloaded the OCR Buddy app, stop. pause this podcast right now and download the app. The app is how I find all my races. And, you know, while the bigger brands like Tough Mudder, Spartan, you can basically look at their calendar and, and figure out when the races are. But a lot of the smaller brands... They are harder to find. So download the OCR Buddy app. You can essentially put in your location and do a search radius or, you know, for a specific weekend. If you're going to be out of town visiting some friends or family, uh, you can search for just that weekend. And that's basically how I find all my races, um, especially the smaller ones. So check that out, OCR Buddy. And they also have some discount codes on there, too. So and I think they also have hotel reservations and stuff like that on there, too. So it's like a one stop shop for all things OCR travel and race related. All right, let's get to today's guest. Joining me, I have Ryan Hart. Ryan, say hi. How you doing? Good. Good to have you on. So Ryan, yeah, man, great. Yeah, <laughs> Ryan's the owner of Heart Heart Fitness. I'm gonna talk a little bit about his bio real quick, and then, but I want to let him do most of the talking. Um, so he essentially owns an OCR gym and is uh, headlines an OCR team called the Flatliners. Uh, if you race in the Midwest, you've probably seen them at. A ton of events because I feel like every race I go to, there's at least one of your guys there, uh, racing representing. So we're going to talk about you know owning a gym, having a team, and Midwest OCR and kind of the state of it, and uh, we'll go from there. So yeah, Ryan, welcome. Sounds like a plan, awesome, Evan. Man, thanks for having me on, man. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, man. I mean, it's it's uh, it's been quite the ride. I mean, it's you know I think we got uh, we got into OCR. Or I got into it probably back in, you know, it's it's very earliest days. I mean, I guess it's probably still pretty, you know, pretty young by most standards. But, you know, the days of, uh, I think the first race I ran was Spartan uh, in Marseilles, Illinois. So, you know, the, the quote-unquote Chicago Spartan, um, you know, yeah, the, back the, in. Is that the old Dirt Runner course? That's the old Dirt Runner course, which yeah. is the funny thing. The first time I ran it, I didn't know about Dirt Runner, and I and the first time we ran it, like all the obstacles we did were essentially like there was a few Spartan ones there, but it was pretty much all Dirt Runner stuff, which I didn't realize until the next year I ran it. The next year I ran it, I were running through, and that's by the time like Spartan got the Reebok sponsorship and stuff, and I'm running through, and I'm like, how come we're not using like that thing and that thing and that thing, and I'm like. Oh wait, no! They're like, no, this is a permanent course here. I didn't even know at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I realized that, like, oh wait, I met TK and stuff, and realized that there's actually this place down there that has per- a permanent course. And then I started running those races then too. But, um, but yeah, that was probably like 2011 or something. I mean, I think that was Spartan's like first ever race out in maybe second race out here in uh, in Illinois. That's, that's actually pretty and, cool that they used a lot of the permanent uh, obstacles on the venue because one dirt run has some had some really good uh, oh my God. permanent obstacles like the big buccaneer swing and like the telephone pole sticking out of the side of the hill. But right, the, they didn't. They used that. They didn't use the the buccaneer swing. Um, the sternum checkers were in there, um, which were always you know. I mean, the higher those things got, the tougher they got. Yeah. Um, but um, the rope climb was essentially just a a rope attached to a so is you know vertical ropes attached to a horizontal rope so as you tried to climb the thing and this is back when almost no one knew how to climb a rope right like nowadays that's pretty you know everybody's been doing it long enough it's like that's pretty basic but back then it was like oh man a rope climb haven't seen this since like gym class and as you climb the thing it was sagging down it kept dropping you into the water because it was hanging from an unsolid object (laughs) you're like (laughs) this is brutal yeah, it was it was crazy. I think it was like November first or something. I mean, it was cold and and nasty and, um, but but yeah, it was mostly it was mostly dirt runner stuff. I mean, it was it was those sternum checkers. It was uh, the the all the balance stuff they had out there. Um, I mean, there was the carries and stuff like that with Spartan, but there was a ton of stuff that I didn't realize was specifically dirt runner stuff until I started running dirt runners races. Yeah, I, I wish the uh, big brands would do that more, like utilize some of the obstacles on some of the venues, right? So when Tough Mudder uh, started using the Battlegrounds venue, I was like, oh, cool. Maybe they'll do like a more of like a hybrid. So like there's a unique Battlegrounds experience <laughs> to the Tough Mudder Missouri event. And they didn't they didn't use any of the obstacles. They're just like, all right, we're just going to ignore this stuff just for um, to make sure their brand was consistent across the country, which right. I, get, I get. 
as like a big company, but at the same time, like if you've got something unique there, like why would you not yep. use it? And then maybe uh, and that, you'll get some people who are willing to travel. Like, oh, this is a a hybrid battlegrounds tough mutter event, so you're going to get a little bit of the different flavor. But I don't know. Well, something specific to that spot, yeah. right? And that that's totally cool. I mean, again, it is. Everything is kind of now. I mean, I don't want to say. I mean, to some extent, some of it can kind of be a bit cookie cutter with the bigger brands, where you know so much of what you're going to get. Yeah, it's almost. I mean, back then, like we knew, like we didn't know what was going on. Like there was no map, there was no anything. <laughs> so I mean, and wherever you did go, it could be specific to that venue because it was. Yeah, they were just using kind of what they had. And I mean, I that first couple of Spartan races, we didn't know what we were getting into. How many miles was you know, that was back in the day when they would put the mile three sign out there. And, like, you're looking at your watch, like, this is mile five and a half, man. Like, this is not mile three. <laughs> you know, and they would just mess with me like that. And now it's like, you know, I mean, it's it's much more of a sport now. So they don't they don't go that route as much anymore. But, yeah, it was fun. It, it was fun. So we kind of got into, you know, I mean, it, it was, I mean, of course, Warrior Dash was my first one, right? And then got introduced into Spartan Race. And then, like, that's when I realized, like, this is something that can be serious. Like, this is serious. Like, this isn't just running around like the, the mud run thing. Like, I, I really identified with the whole thing that, like, especially back then, what, like, Joe DeSena was trying to put out there with, you know, um, the, the building better humans thing. And then, you know, I, I you know, yeah, I was a personal trainer working the fitness industry since, like, 2000, 2003. And, you know, there's this opportunity now that comes up to be a Spartan SGX coach which I kind of really thought was going to kind of take things to the next level. I'm like, well, I'm going to get certified in that. I think I was one of the, you know, uh, second or third graduating classes uh, in that one. And uh, surprisingly a hard test. I mean, it, we, we had just a weekend of we had to show up on site and, and go through um, all of the, uh, you know, the protocol and stuff. And, and, you know, they put us through the ringer with workouts and stuff. And, of course, the you know, the infamous like 30 – or the uh, the five minute burpee test and all that stuff, which I'm not even sure they do anymore. Um, I'm not even familiar with but, that. Ex- explain that for our listeners. So, back when Spartan SGX first came out, I, I th- th- infamously it was created by Joe Desan and a few other the, the 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 kind of founding you know fathers you know of Spartan you know back in the day. And, and I guess their original plan was so hard that nobody passed it. So they said, okay, if we're going to get this out, and it sounds like Spartan, right? So it's like, okay, so if we're going to get this out to the public, we, we have to actually, we want to make sure we actually have coaches. So we have to actually, you know, um, make this somewhat accessible. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think the first one was they had people out and, you know, the out in Vermont on Joe's farm, whatever, and doing some type of stuff, which he probably designed for them not to be able to finish, right? It's like that, that would seem kind of what he would do. By the time it got to, to us, it was still hard. I mean, it, it, I think they do a lot of online stuff now. But back then, you had to show up. That we were, um, we had we met at a at a at a basement of an Atletico that was probably um, just outside of O'Hare Airport. You know, so you know, I'm out here in in, in Chicago, so it's just outside of o- O'Hare Airport. You got this basement of this Atletico. I mean, I mean, just like, you know, I mean, I mean, not even. It, it was totally Spartan, right? It's like it, it's you're down there. It's like there's like a leaking ceiling and stuff, whatever. And it's like okay, we're gonna get certified, cool. But it felt like this is how it kind of should be, right? You wouldn't want this to be like some kind of corporate office or something. And uh, we got to go upstairs in the gym and do some of the workout. Uh, it was a, I think maybe sixteen, fifteen, no, no more than fifteen, ten to fifteen people, something like that in there is is what we had. Um, and everybody had already done spartan races some people had already done ultras some people had just kind of got into it um you know but but a very awesome group of people in there that were very invested in kind of bringing this thing to the masses and um you know and and i was kind of i was working out of a small little personal training studio at that time just starting up my own business um and i really thought that this could be something that could kind of take it to the next level something unique you know i worked in a very competitive area where you've got you know i mean just tons of big box gyms and crossfit gyms and mom and pop just little you know studios and weight loss places stuff like that and like well ocr was just taken off at that point i'm like this has got to be something that I think we can really find a niche into if I can if I can find a place that, you know, can kind of support this a little bit, you know, funds are low, not a lot of money, but figure this is pretty bare bones anyway. So like, you know, 
Um, and the class was was great. I mean, they they ended up. I think it was maybe five hundred dollars, something like that. I think to get certified in, in the beginning there um, could have been maybe a little more than that. But the two days of a class, Saturday and a Sunday, um, a lot of more informative as far as just nutrition and um, just you know race preparation and things, uh, tons of mobility stuff in there. I mean, I think for the first workout i think we spent like 45 minutes just crawling around the ground doing bear crawls ape crawls spider-man crawls all these different animal movements that you know you're thinking the next day you walk you wake up you're like oh my god man i am sore as can be i didn't lift a weight and and you know you're as sore as can be so you're really seeing kind of what they're trying to you know the type of fitness they're trying to put out there more just kind of you know, what they called it, you know, human, right? Just like, you know, movements that people, not so two-dimensional, bicep curls, things like that, stuff that most people are doing to the gyms, like they really are, were giving people, like when they would say, you know, ripping them off the couch, that's kind of what they were, you know, were, they were really about. So it was cool. And it really seemed like it was something you could bring to everybody um, at every level. Um, so workouts were hard, um, you know, and then when it came time to take the test, you got three chances to tank this or to, to pass this test. And you're thinking, well, it's just a weekend class, right? I mean, I got certified um, through a, uh, a National Personal Training Institute, which um, back in this day was a pretty tough certification to get. I mean, that was a six-month certification. We had to show up on site four days a week. It was four hours a night to do that thing. Um, you know, it was two hours of practical, two hours of book time. And then that test was a, was a hard test to pass. You're thinking this test is going to be nothing like that, mm -hmm. man. This is one of the hardest tests I'd ever taken. I actually didn't pass the first time and I wasn't the only one. Most of the other guys in the class were like, Oh my God, man, I couldn't believe how hard that test was. It took me two times to pass it. It was very, very difficult. Um, so that was encouraging though, right? That seemed like, I mean, they're really taking this seriously. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it, it got to a point where, um, you know, you get, you, you know, you pass the class, you get certified and, and, um, I ended up finding a place that was about five miles down the road from the current place I was at kind of unincorporated area, uh, not huge, but definitely something I knew I could start with. It had the high ceilings for the rope climbs, you know, a warehouse type thing. Um, and it was an unincorporated area, so I didn't have to worry about any kind of uh, zoning issues, stuff like that, which I knew, like, for what I had in mind, for what I wanted to do, um, I, I we were going to have low visibility because we weren't going to be, like, in a shopping center. Mm. But we were going to be able to do things that I would never be able to do if I was out, even in a place where even a lot of CrossFit gyms were at. Like, you know, I mean, this place was really kind of, it's kind of wild, wild west back there. I mean, it, it, people just kind of do what they do and nobody asks any questions. So it's like, you know, it, it's kind of one of those ask for uh, forgiveness, not, not permission, permission things. Yeah. And uh, I've never had to ask for forgiveness because nobody cares. So we've, we've been able, you know, um, it was a good place to, to pick. Yeah, so you you decided to set up this gym and give me some of like the, you know, maybe unexpected challenges you encountered or some of the things that um some of the things you thought you did well setting setting things up. So, you know, initially we we come out, you don't really know, there's nothing to go off of, right? I mean, it, it's SGX, you know, provides a, a a training program and the first they got they have a 12 week program is is kind of what it is it's broken into three different sections uh three different phases um and only in the last phase are you supposed to really start hitting any obstacles now this may have changed you know since then i haven't really utilized that for a long time but in the in initial stages here it was kind of the first the first four weeks was kind of a mobility things like that again they're assuming you're just taking people off the couch here um, <clears throat> next few weeks, you're ramping things up a little bit more strength training, conditioning, things like that. And only on the last four weeks of the program, would you start hitting obstacles? And we worked that program for, you know, I, I did that for maybe the first two sessions of it. You know, maybe I did two 12 week sessions of it. And we always put it out like with directly before, like if there was a Midwest race coming up, you know, Chicago race, we would kind of, you know, put it out perfectly 12 weeks before. So we'd schedule it out like that. But what we found really quick was that's number one. That's not the way that people do it in, in a sport. 
that almost no one knows about still. As much as like it became, you know, so commonplace for us to be doing this, you realize that the most of the world, I mean, even the UPS drivers and people that I would have come into the place, they'd come in and they look around like, oh, cool, CrossFit. Or they'd come in and they say, oh, cool, Ninja Warrior. And you're like, oh, man, wrong on both the couch. And if you asked them if they knew which Spartan race was or Tough Mudder, they had no idea. Maybe they heard somebody who ran one of those things, but they always associated the mud run thing to it, right? So it's like, how are we going to get this for people going to take it more seriously, right? And we knew we had kind of the Spartan, you know, uh, branding and stuff a little bit. They're always very particular about how you use their branding, which I've always found interesting because it's like, hey, man, we're promoting you guys. So that more people know who you are, so that more people come to your race and they come through us to go to your race. Um, and it's always odd working with them because they, they seem to not always want you to so much promote. This. It's gotten different since, you know, DECA and stuff like that has started, which they're much more lenient with. But in the days of just Spartan race, it was very weird. It was almost like, OK, so we want You want us to train people for your race, but we can't put our your logo on our obstacles so what exactly then you know how are people going to associate that logo with something that they want to start doing it was weird but mm. we uh you know we we that was that was always kind of challenging in, in the beginning i mean it, it's um but we realized that like we had to start developing our own type of thing like i, I realized like there's really no way that this particular program people want to hit obstacles if they're going to come to a gym they want to do like they're they're gonna leave their CrossFit gym or leave their whatever or or add their you know our gym to their repertoire because you're offering something different than they can do at their gym and and a lot of this stuff even the hybrid fitness thing that's kind of become popular today is kind of stuff we were already doing because that's kind of why OCR is already like a lot of the OCR athletes are very you know into that is because that's kind of something that was already associated with OCR beforehand, even going into Spartan stadium races and stuff like that. I mean, that's, you know, you're, you're throwing, um, you know, CrossFit type workouts in there. Nothing again, like, you know, too skill based muscle up stuff like that, but you're throwing the assault bike in there. You're throwing, you know, uh, Ram burpees in there. You're, you're throwing, you know, things in there, slam ball, stuff like that, that kind of bridges the gap between the two. So we started kind of creating workouts on that thing. Um, and, and as time went on, we, we developed these simulations that um, really started to become pretty popular in the area. Um, and in fact, sometimes people would come in and do these simulations and say, oh, that was way harder. You know, I'm getting ready for a Spartan race. And I went to do the Spartan race and realized, holy crap, that was actually easier than what you guys had us doing. <laughs> You know, at the gym, which was always good because people always went there and thought, hey, this is way this is, you know, really prepared me for, you know, what I was getting into. Um, you know, but it was always it, it's it's a, it, it can be an arms race. Right. Spartan gets a new obstacle right back. Then they get Twister. And it's like, well, you got to get one of those. Well, who makes any of those? Right. And this is before, you know, nowadays we got such a close relationship with like race ready obstacles and people like that, that that make these things. But back then. You couldn't find this stuff. It's like right. a twister. I mean, you didn't even know where to get it welded at. So you you'd find we had a a uh, um, a longtime athlete of ours named a vet who um, found somebody um, to weld us our first twister. It was not the right, you know, uh, um, the specs on it weren't. The handles were a little bit too big and stuff like that. But it worked. It was great. And it was like, okay, we got one. And it was amazing how that in itself would just draw people to the gym because people were like, well, I have one attempt on this obstacle at a race. If I don't get it, I got to do 30 burpees. I have to see this thing before the race. And you would get people coming to the gym. Sometimes, you know, you, you would know that they were, you would get those that were interested in doing classes. And then you would get those that you're like, you're just here to use a twister, aren't you? You know, and and, and stuff like that. So, um, but it would build. And 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 it was, um, you know, it got to a point where we actually got, um, you know, OCR was growing pretty well. And we were pretty well known for what kind of what we were doing. And we actually ended up another space um, in the units that our uh, landlord owned uh, opened up. And it wasn't right next to us. It was actually a couple driveways down. 
But we thought, well, you know what? Three quarters of our workouts are outside anyway. I mean, in our simulations, we're having people run three to six miles, you know, depending on what it was. So there really wasn't a big deal if we had people running from gym to gym and if we could That's build hysterical. some more obstacles. Yeah. Oh, it was awesome. Um, That's so funny. I love it. I love it. That it's like yeah. broken into two different areas. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, down the street, on the driveways, between the two gyms, in the yard. I mean, whatever we could use. I, again, what I said, if we if we were doing this anywhere but what we were, where we were doing it at, it would not have worked. People would have been like, hey, you can't do this. But uh, no, we, we had no issues. Our neighbors were, you know, if not, if anything, they were entertained by it. Um, you know, I was saying, what the heck are these people doing? Uh, running down the street with wreck bags and stuff like that, whatever. And we were able to really develop it where we had, we got monitors inside of all the gyms where we'd send the workouts up where it would show almost an entire race course on there and people could see one after the other what the next thing was coming in the event that a coach wasn't in there. Because a lot of times, you know, coach, it would be just me running back and forth between the two places and trying to motivate people, trying to help people on stuff and get back over here. And, you know, I mean, it's uh, it was nothing if not a passion project for sure. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, it, 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 it worked. It was there. There was always a way to. You know, there was always challenges, obviously, but it was it, it started off like, you know, I mean, we thought it was kind of if, if you build it, they will come scenario. Gotcha. Now, take me forward to the kind of development of your team, the Flatliners, who, like I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, I tend to see it. Basically, if you head up to the Chicago area, you'll, you'll see them at a race. It's like pretty much guaranteed. So we, you know, it was kind of like we got the gym, you know, and how do you really advertise, right? I mean, how do you, number one, like we have this great community and and you want to, there, I think a lot of people, you know, in, in, in a lot of different gyms, CrossFit, stuff like that, like you can definitely, you know, take a, a, a bit of a, um, you know, some kind of advice from like the CrossFit community, how they build these these communities where people really want to show up, you know, that night you don't want to work out that night. You don't want to, whatever, you know, like people expect you to see there, you know, see at the place. So it's like, you know, it gets you to go to the gym and we definitely had that kind of community there. And we could tell that already at races and stuff like that, we were making a bit of a presence. And, um, it, it just kind of came to me one day where I'm like, you know, I mean, you could see there was these different teams out there and stuff. And, and I, I, I didn't put a ton of thought into the name, to be honest. Like I thought, like I originally, every time that, you know, people would see yeah. us or they would know that I came up with the name Flatliners, they assumed I somehow saw that movie or loved that movie. I've never seen the movie. I don't know the Flatliners movie. I, I know Lucy, what it's about. Um, it more came off the fact that my last name is Hart albeit spelled just, you know, H-A-R-T, but, you know, so that's a nice little, that's, that's a, it's a nice little in when you're in the fitness community, when your when your name is already heart, it's like, okay, that kind of works. I mean, the, the business was called heart fitness. So, well, how do you, you know, what do you put in there that sounds kind of like, you know, you know, that has to do with the heart in some way. So I thought, well, flatliners, but I didn't want to make it sound like we were trying to kill people, right? It's like, well, that sounds kind of morbid, right? You guys are the flatliners. Um, so we came with the whole slogan that, that it's failure that is dead on arrival. So our whole thing was that mm. no matter what it was you were doing, right, you, whether you're the you know, top elite athlete, um, you know, top age group athlete, somebody highly competitive, highly invested into it, or you are that person that's just kind of getting started coming off the couch, whatever that next obstacle is, and this was all, you know, I mean, this, you know, OCR to a lot of you know, in a lot of ways is kind of a microcosm of life, right? I and mean, it's kind of personified on the course. Yep. It, it's like you can overcome that. And and it could be for one person, it could be that podium. You know, it, it could be that PR. But for the next person, it might just be getting over the, the six foot wall. Um, it, it might just be getting over the, the fear of the dunk wall, which personally I had, like, I'm not a swimmer. And I remember the first couple of times I went to that dunk wall, and, you know, now I'll just fly right underneath and come out on the other side of it. But the first couple of times, I'm like, I don't like this. You know what I mean? And it's like, this is a big deal. Like, and, and if people can take that, you know, once you approach that, once you arrive at that obstacle, right? Like, it, it's, you've already, you've already made it farther than you thought you were going to make it. Because you already didn't think you were going to be there. You probably already thought maybe you wouldn't do the race that morning when you got those race nerves. Then you got to the race and already kind of thought, well, I'm not going to even approach this obstacle when I get to this obstacle. Then you're standing in front of that. I, you've conquered failure numerous times already. 
So what's one more time? And, and that's kind of what the whole slogan was. So when we put those two together, it's like, okay, this flatliners thing could really work. Um, and it did. Like it did. Like it's just, it, it's that, that, you know, Legendborn designed us a, a great jersey that, you know, kind of um, just had this pulsing, you know, uh, kind of heartbeat, just, you know, really like stood out in pictures and stuff. And, um, yeah, I mean, it was there was a little bit of confusion sometimes because the gym was called Heart Fitness, the team was Flatliners, and sometimes even people didn't know what team to sign up for. I, like people would say, "Hey, you guys only have you know uh, twenty people to race. You guys usually have 40. It's like, and they'd look and be like, "Oh, I see. Half the team signed up for Heart Fit. The other half the team signed up for Flatliners." Like that <laughs> was always an issue. It's like it's the same team. Um, I, you know, I think I think the branding's awesome. I love it. I think it's super creative. I did not think of the movie when you mentioned it. I, I mean, I assumed it was linked to your last name. So I think it's, to me, that's spot on. I think it's, it's great. And the the jerseys awesome. do look amazing. They do pop, uh, the you know the black and uh, red and kind of grayish uh, colors there. Yeah. I yeah, it. pretty basic, but it works. I love it. So take me. Um, so you start you start building this uh, great community. I know. I I was actually looking at coming up to one of your events, one of your twenty four hour events you did. I think it was like 2019 or something mm-hmm. and uh, i had it like penciled into my calendar and i i can't remember why i ended up crossing it off i think it was i didn't want to mess up a toughest motor or something I, either i had a toughest motor right before or right after i can't remember exactly but never i never quite ended up making the trip up there it's a bit of a drive i think it's about eight hours uh from where i'm at um and then uh so things seem to be going well take me to 2020 and covid so you know we've got uh we're moving along well when i say well you know in the ocr terms right which is for most gyms that really dedicate themselves mostly to ocr if your head is above the water you're doing good um you know you're you're not it's still not a very popular sport the midwest is is one of the worst places for it unfortunately and we have some extremely dedicated people i mean again like you say when you you show up to any midwest race you're going to see us. The team travels well. Uh, we hit up OCR Worlds very deep. We 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 have athletes that have you know will go from everywhere to to Greece to California. They're in. T- I mean, team travels well. The whole thing. And, and sometimes it unfortunately because of that, it looks like we're doing better financially than we actually are. You know what I mean? Because there's just so much invested in it. And I I don't. We're not like. It's hard to even put out the prices for what you should charge people because what are you competing against? Like there's no market for it. It's like you are the only market for it so that you can look at yourself like a boutique or something and charge, you know, this crazy amount of money for it. You can look at it like, look, man, like this is what people want to do. This is all they've got. So, you know, and and when you run it like that, I've always said I I really always run the, the business more like a team than a business. And in that's gotten me. In some ways, it's got it's had some great repercussions because anytime the gym gets in a jam, people come through. They come through in ways that there's just no other way that any other that anybody would come through like this for anybody else. Like mm-hmm. it is humbling every single time. COVID was one of those years. Um, you know, uh, it, I'm gonna, it, one question before we. Sorry, I thought of another. Yep. Did, did you run kids classes too, or just adults? So we did mostly adult classes. Yep. Okay. Yeah, mostly adult classes. We got linked up with a, a, a few schools, one middle school in particular um, that was interested in um, – that actually ran one of our events um, that or that ran a kid's event that did really well. Um, and we got sponsorship with them, put the banner up in their gymnasium, the whole thing. Problem was that was October of 2019. And ah, 2020, yeah. all schools got shut down or shut down, and then after that, like they're just there was no interest in it again. Um, yeah, because I've heard so, I've heard with uh, with ninja gyms, obstacle course racing gyms, and and martial arts gyms, like the kids end up funding a lot of the like keep the keeping the lights on essentially because there's, there's a lot of kids, there's a lot of parents that want their kids doing activities, you know, and then they just uh, they make them up the yep. majority of the actual income. Yeah, no, I and I hear that all the time. You're 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 on. You hit the nail on the head for sure. We hear that all the time. I mean, any kind of ninja gyms that are in the area, stuff like that. That's the same type of stuff that that you know we hear. 
Um, it, it's, I, I, I think part of it is kind of being a one man show. I mean, I've got one of the coach, John Caluzzi. He's a fantastic athlete, fantastic coach, but we both also have other training we do outside of the gym. So as far as the time we can dedicate to that place. And, and, and part of it too, is the fact that every single workout that we do at the gym is written. Like we almost never repeat a workout. Like everything is been Besides the simulations was kind of run on a, on a monthly basis. We'll have three different versions and run it throughout the month. Um, everything else, I mean, it was just constant programming workouts, constant whatever. And, and, and it would almost it would be one of those things where we would have to bring somebody in to even do that. Um, we do have kids come in um, and do like some open gyms, things like that. They'll kind of schedule it privately, like with their parents, stuff like that. Um, the gym, unfortunately, too, is a bit too adult oriented in even some of the obstacles like our traverse wall is almost impossible for somebody who's not at least four feet to grab. You know what I mean? Like it's just yeah, like they're built it, for adults, adult sizes. Totally. Yeah. 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 And, and, and we just don't have enough flexibility. Like it's still a, like, we have, so, you know, 2020 comes, we've got the two gyms and, you know, there's kind of, you know, when it rains, it pours, right. Not only is, does the, the business itself, like we have to step back. We've got um, the the other job that I have, which is also in fitness. I, I've got a uh, uh, there's an engineering uh, forensic engineering company that is about 20 minutes from the gym that hired me about 10 years ago to be their on site like corporate personal trainer or fitness trainer. Phenomenal gig, phenomenal people, and in a lot of ways it helps keep the gym open. Well, they had to shut down for COVID, and I get paid there pretty much like a vendor. So I, if I'm not working, I don't get paid. So that's a huge chunk of income gone. The cool thing was everybody at the gym, even when we were shut down, kept their memberships going, knowing they didn't want to lose the place. So even though I lost all that money, they kept it going. Even with that, um, you know, you still are, you're taking a big hit on income, had some personal stuff going on at the time too, where, I mean, it, it ended up that I ended up living in the gym for about six months, um, mm-hmm. just trying to get my life together. And we had the, and the gym I was living in was the gym that we ended up having to close down. So the first gym that I got, uh, the very original gym, um, was the one we ended up closing down. The one a couple driveways down is the one that we kept. And at first it looked like it was going to be, disaster right we're like you know this is really cutting in half kind of what we're doing um the cool thing was i had aaron and dana from i i mean i cannot say enough nice about about these people like what they've been able to do the 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 couple from race ready obstacles they basically rebuilt our gym in a way that we don't really miss the other gym that much and then we got this we we kind of this just chance thing happened where my landlord he was moving his uh 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 landscaping company uh he was selling that and behind our facility there's a a huge well not huge but it, but there's about a quarter mile trail there so relatively technical trail goes around the pond he owned that and he used all that for storing a lot of his equipment for uh his landscaping company well when he knew that we lost the other gym he goes, well, you guys do have your workouts outside anyway. He goes, can you guys utilize this trail? And we're like, I mean, could we ever? Like, that's we need more of that trail. We need this gym. So he ended up giving that to us. So we ended up picking that up. So we lost the gym. We got, a, we got a trail behind the gym, which we're able to put the rope climb on there. We got walls out there. We're going to get a rig built on there this year. The tire flips are out there, sandbag carries, bucket carries. And, and it's this pond that tends to overflow when it rains a lot. So you tend to get waist deep water out there. So it's like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a race all the way. Like people are coming in, they're, they're getting onto, you know, the obstacles in the gym with mud on them and soaking wet and stuff like that. It's like, okay, man, like this is what we needed. Like this is, you can't simulate an obstacle course better than this. Right. Um, So, I mean, yeah, it was, it was a tough situation. Um, But again, we had the we had the right people. I knew gyms that were probably doing financially better than we were that that ended up closing because they were a bit more financially invested into it. And, you know, looking at the numbers, every indication showed that we should have shut down. Um, But I I just couldn't do it. I mean, for me, if if, you know, as much as I do this for, you know, for the team, for everybody else. And again, if I run it like a business, I shut it down. 
But yeah. I just I looked at it, I'm thinking, what what are we gonna do? And and then this is like such a big part of me. I'm like, I, I if I lose this, what am I doing? And so no, we I mean and, and people just kept going. And I mean it it's it I can't say that we have recovered from that year, um, but we definitely um you know, I mean, we're still going strong. I, I, again, it's like you see us at all the races, you see us at wherever, and, and it, it, it's we're still killing it. Um, so as long as this team continues to kill it, it seems to show up for me. It's like it's very hard for me not to show up for them. The, the fact that you're still here says a lot. I mean, there was a t- so many gyms. I watched so many gyms and friends that own gyms like close over COVID. You know, it's just just brutal. So, yeah, the fact that you're still here I think says a lot. Uh, and it says a lot about, one, the community you've built and two, kind of your passion for OCR. So um, it's good good to hear, good to see. All right, so take us through, you know, if people are listening, they're like, oh, this sounds like a great community. This sounds like some cool events you have going on. Take us through kind of what events you have coming up in 2023 and kind of what your current plans are and the state of the gym uh, looking forward into the future. So we got uh, – we, we've, we've had one event we've always done called the D. DOA event, you know, um, you know, the, the whole failure is done on arrival. So DOA event, it's kind of evolved over the years. It, it's it's evolved pretty well into the fact that now it's a whole weekend. So we have a series over the course of the the year that actually is an OCR World Championship qualifying um, uh, series for the Pro Division of OCR Worlds. It would have been for the age group as well. I got it. Um, I got the the uh, the qualification uh, approved from Rachel Ann. Uh, in 2019 um, and then 2020 happened and then of course then age group uh, requirements for OCR worlds were you know were negated so that hasn't helped and that I think would have helped the gym a whole lot more on um, the pro thing um, we got tons of athletes that'll I mean that'll pretty much every athlete we got is going to go to OCR worlds and come out with their band on um, but they're not going to run down Ryan Atkins, you know, and things like that. So it's yeah. like, that's, you know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, they, they, do they belong in the pro wave? Absolutely. When it comes to obstacles and are they holding their own and, and putting up a, an impressive time? Absolutely. Are they going to hit the podium? Probably not. So again, the age group thing probably does do better for us than that. Haven't been able to utilize it just yet, but the cool thing is, um, we usually start that series in April or May. I think we're going to shoot more April this year. We have three different versions of the races where we've come up with over the years. So a lot of the times over the week, we have just simulations. They don't count for anything. But sometimes um, certain events over the over the course of, of, of the months leading up to the DOA event, which we have not yet set a date for this year, but will most likely be sometime late August, um, there is uh, what we call the pulse. So the pulse is very Spartan style. Um, quick one, I don't want to say one dimensional, but quick obstacles, right? So, you know, a rig, no harder than you'd see at Spartan race could be rings, could be rings with a lateral bar, could be rings with maybe, a, you know, two or three vertical grips on the end, but no nunchuck stuff like that. It'd be some kind of a rope, something like that. Very much what you would see the Spartan race. Um, rope climbs, there will be carries in there, stuff like that. So very, very straightforward and fast. Um, we have qualifying times for that and a whole point series, whole leaderboard for that entire thing. We have one called the hybrid. The hybrid is essentially taking the, 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 the newest, you know, uh, kind of craze and something that fits our gym very well, the DECA high rocks thing and mixing that into more of a savage race style thing. So now, you know, the burpees are gone, things like that. Uh, the one attempt on an obstacle is gone. Now it's multiple attempts. We give athletes two bands, and they will uh, – each one of those bands is worth 10 points apiece. Um, so, obviously, it, it you know, you have to finish fast, but finish with both your bands. And you mix that in with, you know, 500-meter skiers and 500-meter rowers and, and maybe ramp burpees and a tank push-pull and all this stuff inside of that thing. Again, another qualifying time that you have to get to qualify for the DOA event. And then we have one called the Legion. And the Legion is just where we just – we pretty much take the whole gym, connect it together. It's just a grip, you know, uh, crusher. I mean, it is – it's cargo nets into Twister, into Kraken, into a 40-foot rig. Um, and there could be six, seven miles of running in that. That is the one that we can utilize for the OCR World's, uh, uh, World Championship qualifier. So we can qualify – up to six athletes, three three men and three women. The top three men on our leaderboard and the top three women on our leaderboard qualify for OCR World Championships uh, Pro Division. Um, so 
those everyone who qualifies for that can do the DOA event in whichever they qualify for, or all three if they want. Um, then we have open divisions in that as well for people that just want to do um, the you know one of those divisions just just for fun. Um, the Labor Day is is probably one of our most popular events. It's a six hour endurance event. Uh, just seems to have a great turnout every year. The first two hours of the Labor Day event, we do um, a it's an easier rig, so it could be more of a Spartan, you know, style rig, something like that. Um, next two hours, we upgrade the rig again. And again, with this is, you know, you're talking each each lap they run is probably three to five miles. So they're doing this and continuously. And every time we hit the next two hour mark, we just upgrade the rig. It's mixed in. We have everything else out there from the carries to the rope climbs to um, Valkyrie um olympus and, and and again it's mixing all of our obstacles in with carries with all that stuff but the rig kind of becomes a determining factor of like you'll see a lot of times that that our real fast runners will get to that rig first when it switches over on our four it goes to the hardest rig for the last two hours and we've seen a lot of lead changes over the years um because the fastest runner wasn't always maybe the best uh obstacle racer so they would end, especially in the women's division, we see this a lot where our women, because we've got really good women when it comes to obstacles, like they're really good. Um, and sometimes they may get run down by some of the faster runners, but the the, the, the stuff they see on a regular basis, of these classes, like they, they kind of get unimpressed a little bit when they go to some of the races and like, we'll set some things up that are pretty crazy and they'll get it and they'll get ahead. Um, that's always a fun one. Um, so then the 4th of July has always been an endurance event. Started off as a 12 hour event years ago. Um, we changed it to a 4x4x48. Four by four by so we kind of, we we're, we were doing a little, the David Goggins 4x4x48 uh, by four by challenge. Um, do you know what that is? I do. You, well, you run uh, four miles every four hours for 48 hours, right? Right. So yeah. we thought, well, wouldn't that be cool if we just mixed in obstacles with that? Like, we'll just do Oh, that's obstacle. good. That is good. And it was cool. But it was such a commitment to people. You know what I mean? Like, There's I don't know if yeah. everybody, you know, right. You know, husband, wife, somebody might get a little mad. if like, hey, I'm going to be gone for 48 hours, you know, because <laughs> I'm doing this thing, right? So, you know, it was it was a fun event. People had fun with it. We, we only required, like, if you were going to go for the podium, you had to, it was kind of a last man standing thing. And nobody ever made the full 48 hours. Um, I think we had people go up to 32 hours before. Um we had people, if they wanted the medal, they had to do at least three of them in a row. And you would see the majority of the day would be like that 6 a.m. time slot and then, at the, and then like 6 a.m., 10 a.m., uh, 2 p.m. Like they would come and do those three and then it would be gone. So we are actually have a poll on the page, on our private page right now, the team page, asking about what they want to do this year. And I think this year we're going to go into a team element that's going to mix in our our hybrid athletes, so our DECA High Rocks people, in with our OCR athletes, and they're going to work in conjunction um, to in kind of a tournament fashion. So this is going to be real fun. We're still ironing out the details of it, but it's kind of a tag team type thing, like team runs together, comes in, tags the first OCR athlete in. They have an OCR you know, responsibility, a rig, something like that. They tag the next DECA person. DECA person now has to do 60 wall ball shots. And obviously, they can tag in their partner every time they need a break. They go back and forth, goes back to the OCR person. They hit an obstacle, tags back in the DECA. So, I mean, something along those lines because the DECA, we're a DECA affiliate now. Um, it's done incredible for us. I mean, it's one of the smartest things Spartan has ever done. They gave it to the right guy. Yancey is, I mean, he just, he knows what he's doing and he's done phenomenal with it. And he's done it with, you know, not the biggest amount of resources or team or anything um they kind of got into a situation like like you know most of the gyms did in covid the first ever deca fit event was canceled because of covid and they're kind of thinking what do we do right like this is our thing but they also know there's gyms out there that are struggling so they have the brilliant idea of saying well, we can promote our product while still helping the gyms if we develop two more things that, that the gyms can run inside, we can make them affiliates and they can run these two things in their gym. And then, of course, you know, Spartan Loves is a good trifecta. So it'll be a trifecta piece, right? It's like it, they're marketing all the way when it comes to trifecta. 
So you come to the gyms, you do the deck of strong, you do the deck of mile, and then they run the deck of fit. Nice. And it's been phenomenal. And, and I knew there was a lot of people at our gym that they love the community of OCR. They love the intensity of it, whatever the case may be, right? Skill-wise, they weren't ever going to – there's just going to – be some obstacles that they were just always going to kind of struggle with and things they had the strength they had the engine they had the passion they had all of that and and when the deca thing came out I, there was a few of our, our our people i looked at i said look this is for you like i'm you know th- i'm not saying stop doing ocr but like this is your wheelhouse and uh they listened and and they have all done phenomenal at this so it's a great way to kind of bridge i mean we're all kind of one big community anyway but it's a great way for us to kind of bridge the two together on one day where they all have to work together and like, you know, kind of fight for each other. So um, that's going to be the 4th of July. Gotcha. And where can people find out what's the easiest place to find information about these events? Is it Facebook website? Yeah. Yeah. You know, we do most. So we actually, we, in, in cutting back on expenses uh, for this year, we actually got rid of the website because what we noticed by analytics, everybody was going to just the scheduling page. So, we have, uh, if you go to Google, just Google Flatline uh, OCR or HeartFit Hybrid OCRX, and you will see on there the link to our our, uh, our our bio site. So our link in bio, that has all of our information on it. Uh, we pretty much use it now like our website. Outside of that, you definitely want to follow us on uh, Instagram uh, at HeartFit Hybrid OCRX. Um, that is where we do most of the advertising things like that kicks over to the facebook page of the same name um we do have a private team page that one we keep just for the people in the gym the people on the team but anything that the public would need to know about signing up for our events what the events are about any of that kind of stuff like that um that bio site or the um you know googling us and 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 linking to that bio site or going to instagram um are going to be the two best ways to do it Nice, nice, good stuff, good stuff there. Um, and then give a, give a reminder of where exactly is your gym located? What I know it's near Chicago. What's the actual town? So we're in Plainfield, Illinois. Yeah, just outside of Neighborville. Some people might know Neighborville a little bit better than they know uh, uh, Plainfield. We are literally just on the other side of the train tracks from from Neighborville. Um, so uh, unincorporated area. Um, we are a you know kind of tucked away again in the back. Um, which, like I said, it doesn't work for, for all things. Um, but usually when people are coming to us, they already know where they're going and why they're going there. Um, yeah. So, you know, you don't get a whole lot of walk-in traffic, but uh, most people who walk in at this point don't wouldn't know exactly where they were walking into anyway. Um, we're really trying to hope. I mean, that's part of the mission, right? If We, we want people to know what OCR is. Like, it, it would just be great if it was more of a – mainstream thing and if even i mean i think even us us as athletes don't even know how to define it sometimes because depending on which brand you're talking about you could be talking about a whole different thing and while that's great for variety it's part of the problem sometimes because no one really knows what ocr is because sometimes i don't think ocr really knows what it is yeah no that's that that's that's accurate i get and you mentioned at the beginning People saying CrossFit. I, I still get called CrossFitter or Advent. Oh, you're the CrossFit guy. I'm like, no, definitely yep. not. Oh, uh, you're the uh, you're the adventure racer. Nope, still wrong sport guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, yep. So yeah, it, it, that's pretty common. How far are you guys from where Frontline holds their events? So we're about uh, two hours from Frontline. Yeah, they're up in Byron, so they're they're okay. up more north than we are. Um, now Ed, who is the Ed Leon, who is the the uh, the founder of that race. He lives, he's in Naperville. So, I mean, he's right by us. His, his F3 group is always working out around the area. Ed's been at the gym uh, countless times. Uh, we've always had a great relationship with him. Um, love his race. Frontline is, is a race that personally our team always seems to do really well at because it, it is the one race, especially locally, that does come down to the obstacles, and, and that's where the team tends to shine. Yeah, I mean, you're uh, Chris. One of your guys bumped me from third to fourth. Uh, the one time I made it up the front line, and it was be- so. And it was because it was because of the that Kraken obstacle, which I had never done before. Yeah, he, he yep. had done it in your gym a hundred times, and he he flew through yep. it every lap, and uh, I got stuck there on lap three. 
eventually so made I don't, it across. So I didn't have to tell you. You told me because I saw him just earlier tonight, and he told me. He goes, "Oh, you can talk to Evan." He goes, "Well, you can remind him that I bumped him from yet." So you, yeah, you no, just he, told me you remember. He remembers. So yeah, I'm no, he deserved it. Still- he deserved it. I, I got stuck. I got stuck. It's very rare I get stuck on things anymore. Um, so it was a uh, you know a good reminder, and uh, yeah, yeah, it was just like. I was like, I'm never gonna get across this thing. I was like, I'm I'm about to time out, and I made it across with I think uh, four minutes left or something to yep. start my final lap, and then uh, yep. he was too far gone by that point. So. That thing is, and I, the first that that is a huge benefit to have that in a gym. Like the minute the first year they had that, I struggled on it. I don't the obstacles are usually my game, and I, I I struggled on that thing. And I'm like, we got to get this in the gym. So Aaron and Dana from Race Ready made us one. And it, it's amazing at that race how many times that we have won that race or got ahead because of Kraken, because our athletes now know it like the back of their head. It's something that it does pay to see it on a regular basis. It yeah. really does. So, and if you don't know what we're talking about, so uh, Kraken is essentially, it's like Twister, but instead of handholds, there's nunchucks sticking out of it. So it's a tube, and it's got nunchucks going around in a spiral, and you basically grab, and as you traverse, the thing is rotating. So it's a, yep. it's a it's a little bit awkward. I think I went through like um, face first the first time, which was and you say, yeah, my body's twisting, which is not the right answer. Right. And yep. eventually I figured out I basically go sideways just like I do every other obstacle. And it was a lot easier for me. But yep. it took, it took yep. me. You kind of lock out like. Yeah, it took me a bunch of failures to figure that out. Mid-race. Oh, it does. It does. Yeah. You got to kind of, I mean, for I think I kind of lock out on it, kind of get my legs up a little bit. Like I don't let it twist me away. Like I, 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 I make it come to me and that's what you got to yeah. do. The problem is when you go into it, you've seen Twister so many times, you think it's going to be like that and you realize it's actually clocked in the opposite direction, which mm-hmm. does feel weird once you start doing it. And you can't go backwards on that thing the way that a lot of people do on Twister. So you sit there like, I don't know what to do with this thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good one. It's a good one. All right. Um, any? Let's see what else. Anything else we want to touch on before we start wrapping things up? I I, I was um, just looking over your side, side note. I was just looking over some of the information you sent me about, and uh, you said you won the Dirt Runner Midwest Mayhem twenty four hour race in twenty eighteen. Yeah, that was that was the I I did it in twenty seventeen. So yep. Is yep, uh, that's what I said. I said, well, you weren't there, so I, <laughs> I got a chance to win. I said I got. Uh, I think we had 12 people or something in that, in that 12 hour, that, oh, that 24 hour heat. Um, I it, had, it was small the year I did it too. It was probably about the same size and it was, uh, just so hot that day. I remember it was just brutally hot. Yeah. Ours wasn't too hot. It got a little cool at night. Um, you know, but I just, I, I always, cause I, I have not done a tough mutter and I always wondered how that, compared to a Tough Mudder, because I, I know from what I hear, a lot of times, some of the Tough Mudder courses can be a little bit flatter. I just remember, like, TK, I mean, that guy's course, I mean, I, it's just, I, was, I ended up getting 54 miles in that thing, and I, I swear, 30 of it must have been through trenches, because it's, it's like oh. the whole race was nothing. Sing, there was single a, track trench, run. yeah. It's, right, it's single, single track tr- trench. Yeah, it, it, is, it is rough. You know, I TK's races, so like the, uh, if anyone's read my book, Ultra OCR Man, I talk about the 2017 race in there. And it's also covered in OCR America 1 when I was day set six of my uh, seven day event. But yeah, it is, what's funny is like the obstacles by themselves, you're like, oh, this isn't really a bad obstacle. Right. But there's so many. And when you add them up lap after lap, like, I mean, I would be cramping on like going over like a wall or something really simple. Yeah. So it was well, just had a lot of walls. Uh, it was just, it was a lot when you added it together. Like a single lap, you're yep. like, oh, that wasn't too bad. You know, it was fun. Right. Like, it, it, and then you do like three laps, and you're like, what? Why is my arm cramping climbing over yep. this simple obstacle? It was – and then yep. they yep. – you had like three carries through your field, so you're doing like carries back-to-back for like, I don't know, a half mile or miles. So I don't know what, what it was. Uh, even longer, yeah, it just kept going. I mean, that was like the yeah. one open spot. The sun's beating down, and you're carrying stuff. And then, yeah, with the obstacles, like I remember the year that I did it, um, I actually had um, – so, you know, they'll send out different mess. And, and, you know, TK was great. Loved that course. Missed it like crazy. Didn't always have a ton of volunteers, which we know is an issue for the sport sometimes anyway. Correct, but, like, yeah. man, like, there was sometimes you just didn't get information you needed to get. Like, apparently, we were supposed to stop going over walls at, at 9 p.m. 
Well, I didn't get that memo until <laughs> about 3 a.m. It was like 3 a.m. And someone heard me like groaning as I'm going over a wall. And, and they like went to go tell TK, like, I think Ryan's still out there going <laughs> over walls. And he comes up. And he's like, Ryan, why are you still going over the walls? I'm like, because they're there. He goes, no, 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 no walls since 9 p.m. Like, it's 3 a.m., man. Like, my shoulders are killing me. Like, I would have loved to have got that memo a lot earlier, man, because I'm dying here. Yeah. I, that that sounds completely. I, I feel like that that describes the experience to a T. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. Oh man, that's that's funny. Yeah. Yep. Um. When I so when I I'm gonna joke when I did that one for uh, OCR America, I was the only one on the course, and I was eating so many spider webs. Every tunnel I went through, there was like frogs jumping around in there. Oh God. Yeah. Because no no one else on the course to scare anything away, so it's literally right. me like yep. clearing the path. It was. Yep. It, it it gets deep into the woods, you know, and some of those tunnels were super full of water. Oh, they like, were insane. I mean, if you're claustrophobic, forget about it. And, you know, and that was the thing. And I knew TK had cameras out there, too. So you're running in the forest thinking, okay, look, man, I'm on the outer system anyway, so I'm not going to escape anything. But if I did, I couldn't because I know he's got cameras out here. And he did. There's oh, a, did there's really? I never knew of, that. That's funny. Oh, yeah. There's a picture of me just as I crawled out of the tunnel that I still have to this day. Because I'm like, I knew, you know, he knew he had, he had cameras out there. And, um, yeah, I think there was a lap I was running. I came in and uh, I had uh, my pit crew got smaller every lap I came back. I'm like, everybody's going home. I'm like, okay. And then, like, you know, one guy was left. And he's like, look, he goes, you know, you got you to gotta keep going, got to keep going. Um, you know, you kind of get a little woozy and stuff at this point, whatever, right? I had, you know, at this point, 40 something miles and whatever, like you're feeling pretty good, but he goes, no, he goes, you're in first. He goes, and you got it. He goes, the guy over there, he goes, he he's, he's going crazy, man. He's like, I think he's hallucinating. He's saying he saw a bobcat out there. I'm like, there ain't no freaking bobcat out there. I swear to God, the next lap I go out there, I'm going over the sternum checkers, which at that point I apparently was not supposed to be going over anymore because the wall thing was out. And sure enough, my headlamp just catches these eyes, and I'm looking, and I'm like, that's a bobcat. <laughs> and sure enough, I, he, he was running the other way, but I'm like, I can see him clear as day, and I'm like, headline is, you know. So I come back out after I finish that lap. I go up to my, my guy in the pit crew. Um, and I say, hey, man, I said, he ain't lying, man. There was a bobcat out there. I mean, it was like one of the first things I did when I got home that day is I, like, went to go check, like, the, you know, the whatever, the geographic, where are bobcats? Right? And it was like right line. They're like, oh, yeah, that was. That was a bobcat. Like, son of a – it was crazy. So, yeah, I mean, you and you were alone in that force most of the time because so few people did the race. Correct. You're just out there Correct. like, this is why he told me to bring in nice. <laughs> it, yeah, like Dirt Runner and Shell – hell or shell hill up in vermont like those yep. those give you like the real ultra experience that that your world's toughest mother there's you you can almost always see someone even on like even when it's super cold you can still see someone in the distance even right. in the middle of the night but like dirt runner i mean you were you were by yourself and the, like, yep. like you said that there's no volunteers it's on the honor system so you're out there and you're like i really hope i don't die <laughs> there's nobody out there. no one's gonna find me yeah so yeah, good times. Yeah. I also got yeah. I, I that was the that was the event where I had a um, a raccoon in the middle of the daytime like on the trail like hissing at me and my oh, my, man. my the my, the best man for my wedding who was pacing me for OCR America day, day 7 or 6 on that one. He fought it off with like this 12-inch stick. <laughs> and I, I'm like I'm like too weak to run away. I'm like you need to get rid of this thing. I was like I can't right. I was like, if it lunches at me, it's over. Like, I, I can't run anymore. Um, Handle this, please. Yeah, this is not on me. Yeah, you don't want to run into one of those out there. I was always afraid I was going to run into one of those in one of those tunnels. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because then it's like, what are you going to do? It's like, yeah, that was the one thing. Like, get through this tunnel as fast as you can because, man, if something else comes from the other side, you know, you're, you're stuck. So, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. All right. That, that now that we scared people off of, of uh, small races that are endurance races, right? Yeah, not, not that not that I don't even know of anyone like I, I couldn't even find that an experience like that. Now I would have trouble finding an experience like that in the U.S. Um, nope, unfortunately, point, most of those are most of those brands are gone. Yeah, uh, it sucks, man. It really does. It, it's just people that never got to experience that place. It's so hard to explain to them. Like I'm so glad I have that story. Uh, it's still with, you know, any Spartan Ultra I've done and stuff like that, the big ones. Had some great experiences, you know, Tahoe and, and Killington and all that stuff. I mean, it really, like some of the the, the, the premier venues, 
can't compare it, right? But there's just something special. There was something so awesome. That I, it's still my favorite race is doing that 24-hour out there because it was. It was you against you. And, like, every lap you went out there, like, I just hope I make it back because, like, <laughs> you know, like there's no one out there to help me if I don't. So, yeah, it, it's, it was crazy. All right, let's start wrapping things up. Uh, before we get going, any – oh, tell us something people would be surprised to know about you. So – all right, so I, anybody who probably – so I'd say two things. So anybody who, who knows me wouldn't be this surprised. People who don't know me would be – they'd probably be like, you know, what the hell. They, they see the name in the back of the jersey, uh, Rodimus Ryan. So some people may know what that means. Some people may not. I am the biggest Transformer fan you could probably ever meet. I, I would challenge anybody to ask, you know, to, 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 to challenge me on that. Like, there's nobody nice. bigger. I'm literally sitting in an office right now. That is just I'm surrounded by by transformers and glass cases with like lighting on them. And it's like a museum in here. But it's like it's like, but dude, they're toys. So like, yeah, I mean, most people like again, if you know me, um, anybody in the gym, they know this. Right. They've probably even seen it and like, you know, OK, cool. Like, hey, man, that's your thing, whatever. Um, people that don't know me um, would be shocked to know that I cannot swim. Uh, I cannot swim, have not ever been able to swim. How I got through Killington, that race, doing that entire thing, that 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 huge swim up to the ladder. and the, 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 I did it, but I, I essentially floated like a leaf out to the ladder. I mean, when I got into the water, I remember looking at my athletes, I was seventh in my wave when I got to the water. When I got out, I was like 83rd because I was in there so long. I just put the life vest on floated out there just let the whatever current there was or whatever it's, i i i had to look on the side of the 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 uh on the on the embankment there to to see the cameraman to like use that for reference to see if i was even moving because i could not I, I was just on my back just hoping i was going to make it to one of the ladders so i could climb up the thing go across drop in the water hope my life vest didn't go over my head and then you know, uh, pitifully float back to the shoreline um, and then continue on to do it again later on. So, yeah, I'd say those would be the two things. That's good. The, the first one's really good. You're in good company. I am, I, I although I'm not a big Transformers guy, I, you know, G.I. Joe, He Man, all the 80s action, all the all like 80s cartoon stuff. Uh-huh. I love that. Yep. I was, me and my family went to Comic Con this past weekend. So, uh, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, no, I, you know, G.I. Joe, He-Man, love all that stuff, too. I never got into collecting it, but, um, yeah, just a few days ago, I put on the first couple of G.I. Joe, um, uh, the first couple of episodes they ever had, because I don't remember those as much as I remember the Transformers. I was like, I remember the basic stuff, you know, Cobra Commander and all that stuff like that, but I don't remember specific. I mean, I could probably recite Transformers episodes. G.I. Joe knew it, probably can't know it, but, but I, it was always, I mean, it's freaking G.I. Joe. He's still got to love it. Um, so yeah, I actually was, you know, threw those on a couple of days ago. I was like watching Duke and all that stuff. Like, oh yeah, I remember what it is, man. So yeah, cool. Yeah. The best eighties were the best. Yeah. I always, so I've, I've, I've rewatched some of the GI Joe cartoons and I'm like, I saw, but now I look at them through like adult eyes. I'm like, how, is oh, Co- yeah. how is Cobra financing all their underground bases? Oh, it, like <laughs> it's really expensive. And like, if you're that it's rich, hard, why man. are you even trying oh, to take so over the world? You're like. You already have you, right. like, you're already multi multi billion dollar corporation at this point. Like I think you guys are just right. <laughs> it, it's you know it's one of those things, right? Exactly. When you watch it with it, you know, with the with the adult goggles on, you also realize that, and this has been proven now since, right? Like they pretty much admitted this, but that all the '80s was all your cartoons you watched were just they were just you know half hour toy commercials. It was just yes. hey, we're yeah. just gonna create some kind of a story, so you just go buy this thing. I mean, don't the, pay attention to the details. The He-Man toys were created first, and then they were like, "We need a cartoon to go along with these toys." <laughs> like, right. they, they yep. built they built the toys, and then they're like, "Now we need a storyline." Yeah, yep. yep. I've yeah, yeah I've watched some of the documentaries in. on Netflix. They're interesting. They're oh, horrible. very cool, right? And I think I think the He-Man thing. I think they were the ones that came in right when the Reagan administration lifted all of the rules about you know, selling toys to kids like that. So they're like, oh, cool, we can do that now? We're going to create a cartoon. And, yeah, they did. So, yeah, so, good stuff. What, what, do you, do you, what do you think of the actual live-action movies? Do you like those, or is that uh... – uh, um, <laughs> I got I got to love hate with them, man. Like, okay, so the, when, the, when the first one came out, you know, w- leading up to it, right, 
like I know all the websites to go to and stuff like that, right? Any 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 transformer geek would. So I knew like already some of the problems it was gonna have because I'm like that doesn't look like Optimus, that doesn't look like Megatron. But I'm like, okay, I got you know, I've got to learn to accept this, right? Like they're coming to the big screen, it's live action. I always wanted this. Let's go with it. The first one I I can deal with, and 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 the movies brought them back. Like they're as popular now as they've ever been, and it's because of those movies. Yeah. But those movies have also been panned. They've been, I mean, I, I always looked at it like I was never a big Marvel guy, right? Like that wasn't really my thing, but I saw plenty of the movies and I appreciated them. I thought they were good and I could appreciate them without knowing a whole lot about it. And I would always sit there and think, you know, these are really quality movies, man. Why did Michael Bay have to direct my movies? Because he <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I didn't get the same kind of thing, man. Like, you know, my franchise deserves this kind of a treatment, and he it just wasn't respected like that. So, yeah, I mean, it's they're entertaining, but they're not good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I I I thought the first one was good, and then I I think I saw one or two other ones, and then at this point, I'm like, how how many are there? I don't even know at this point. And, so uh, the the last one, Bumblebee, check it out. It it's good. It's a it's a it? re it's a it's a reboot, and now they've got the new one coming out in June, which is a, a sequel of that. I'm looking forward to that one again. I'll, I'll go in there with you know, uh, you know, mitigated expectations. But I mean, like, uh, it's the last movie was good. It at least had the heart of it. Michael Bay was not directing it, so I mean, it was a much it in the form. Um, it was good, and I, I got high, somewhat high hopes for the next one. But yeah, one through five. I mean, one was good, and then it it did. It just kind of got like I don't know, man. Like. Ugh. Well, I it, felt like I was part of the problem because I kept paying money to go watch it. I'm like, well, I can't <laughs> complain about it because they're like, hey, I'm part of the billion dollars this thing just made. So, you know. So it, it could be worse. So my favorite character and like from comics growing up was Green Lantern. So that's what that's what I got as an adult. I got the Green Lantern oh, movie with Ryan Reynolds, which everyone yeah. hates. I, yeah. I, was ha- I was happy just to see some of the characters in live action. So my, my opinion of it is biased. I'm not, I don't think it's a great movie, but like I was like, oh, cool. They're actually on screen for once instead of in comic books, but uh, right, what... and that's kind of how it was, you know, yeah. with the first movie, especially, especially you know the the same guy Peter Cullen had voiced Optimus Prime originally, voiced him in the movie, so it seemed pretty authentic and genuine. But yeah, I mean, it was like I, I appreciate this, but like this isn't what I envisioned, you know, and just kind of one of those things. So uh, you know, what are you gonna do? All right, we're gonna get going now that we digressed into a fairly long nerd discussion. Uh, any final shout outs uh, you want to give before we get going? No, you know, I just, I really appreciate you bringing me on seriously. Um, uh, the, the team, you know, we, we hit, you know, again, this last week or so or last month or so, um, you know, numbers were down. We hit another, you know, a couple of financial challenges. The team once again came through. I had to, for the first time ever raise people's uh, rates, which I've never done to this point. And, and people were telling me to do it, uh, which will show you the kind of team that we got, which is phenomenal. Um, but definitely, like, we're just looking forward to these Midwest races coming up. Strong as Oak has got uh, a group that's about two miles w- away from us. Uh, they used to work in the gym with us uh, back in the day. Group we're really close with. They've got – we're the DEC affiliate. They're a High Rocks affiliate. They've got a huge High Rocks thing coming up in uh, on April 2nd, which is really cool. We got Highlander Assault coming up. We're getting ready for that. Their Dark Ages coming up in the middle of May. Frontline after that. Uh team already did great at abominable race and you know just the, these these groups are really what kind of keep ocr going in this area so like we're big time appreciative of them and as i mentioned a few times race ready obstacles like we, they've basically built our gym and now they're basically building a lot of these local races um you know without these groups like this whole thing still is not going so definitely shout out to all them yeah i'm, I'm gonna second a lot of that and especially uh dana and aaron from race ready obstacles uh, they were a great supporter of us last year. They work on like all of the all of the, if you've heard of a small series, like chances are uh Race Ready is like behind the scenes working on some of the stuff. So they are oh, they've also, blown up. Yep, it's yeah. so awesome. They're helping out anyone who uh is going to Mythic Race in mid April. Uh yep. they're helping build that. If uh we do need a couple more people on the strength and speed team, if anyone's listening to this and is headed to Mythic Race and wants to join the team for a day, shoot me a message, I'll, I'll get you added. And then uh, other than that, you can head over to TeamStrengthSpeed.com. We just got large Blegmit Extremes back in. We've got a limited number. I think I've got seven left in stock. Uh, but, yeah, we have all sizes, small, medium, large, extreme, and lights. And then also my books, they're up there. 
some training guides, ultra OCR Bible, new strength and speed guide to elite obstacle course racing. And if you wanted more of the random dirt runner stories, you can pick up my biography, ultra OCR man. I've got some stories in there. Ryan, thanks that again for coming it. on. For sure. Thanks for having me, Evan. Really appreciate it, man. It's great. I'm sure we'll uh, cross paths at some point this year and make a couple of chips up to the up north in your area at some point. So, uh, Absolutely. Looking forward to seeing you and uh, best wishes for you and your team. And we'll see you around. All right. Take care, my friend. Later.